Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with John Herlocker of Tignus. We're going to take a deep dive today into machine learning. This is part of an ongoing series in the use of AI in semiconductor manufacturing. John, machine learning as a term is thrown around, often confused with almost everything else out there. People think AI, machine learning, there's a difference. What is machine learning and what do you use it for? Yeah, thanks, Ed. So I like to talk about this a lot because I, I, I literally had very smart people say, you're not doing AI, you're doing machine learning. Well, the reality is, is that machine learning is, as we learned in the last, last uh, session, machine learning is the foundation for almost all of the sort of advanced capabilities today that affect us that we think of as AI. So I want to dive into, let's just, let's just strip this out. AI is, uh, machine learning is not magic. It's, it's really a mathematical construct, and I want to talk about what it is. And, you know, this is going to help you to understand where you can apply machine learning yourself if you're not already doing it. So really the foundation, machine learning, I like to say it is, is about learning function approximators. And so most of you are engineers, you know, you have mathematical functions or... Um, you know, you have, you know, there's some function that maps some set of inputs to some outputs, but maybe you don't know what this function is, or maybe it's a very complicated function, right? There's a lot of complex physics involved, or maybe there's just a lot of data, or, you know, it's not, you know, it may not be something as simple as a regression, but it's, it's some sort of incredibly complicated relationship that you don't know, you can't actually model it mathematically, but it'd be really useful to know what this F is so that you could apply it in the future. And that is really the core of machine learning, which is, you know, learning these function approximators. Given some inputs so uh, and some outputs, like I would like to have an approximator for this function f, right, that I can apply in the future, right? So, so give us an example here. Yeah, there's many different examples, but let's pick a few from manufacturing. So, so an example might be for predictive maintenance, right? You want to know, you know, when is the best time to, you know, replace a particular component, right? And so, you know, you might have histories of, like, this might be, in, in this case, you might have the X's are, uh, are sort of examples you have in the past of sensor feeds of your equipment tools. And, you know, you're trying to predict a Y, which is that a component's going to fail, right? And so if you can predict when a component's going to fail, then you can change it before it fails, right? So your historical data would be sensor traces, and then your Ys would be when is that component, when that component historically failed, right? And so that's an example of a function I would love to be able to uh, emulate. And you can get a lot more complicated with this too, right? You can say, okay, we predict it will fail at this time. Maybe we should check it at this time. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, in some sense, as long as you can structure your data in the right format, right, you can then, you know, create a predictive function for that, right? I think that's part of my key message here is that at the end, if you can reduce your, your problem down to what effectively looks like a matrix, right, where you have, you know, you have, you know, rows, and each of these rows is an example, right? So one run of a tool leading up to a failure in the use case we talked about, right? Uh, or, you know, it might be, and it could be, it could be a process failure, right? It could be, here's a sensor trace, and at the end, the metrology was bad, right? That's another sort of row example. And so you have kind of the things that you can observe, right? Which are, we call these things features, right? Uh, so you, you kind of have like maybe one, to, uh, one sort of run and you have the features that come off of this run. They might be the traces. So a wafer goes into a chamber. Here's all the measurements I make while it's in that chamber. And then there's sort of a, you know, an outcome. Now in machine learning, we call this a label, right? You say, hey, I'm going to label this. Was it a good or bad is like one example of labels. This could also be a continuous number. It could be like I want to predict, you know, a regression kind of status analysis. So if you can structure your data so that you have effectively like a CSV, you've got rows and you've got columns. Your rows are the individual examples, right, with the label you want to apply, and your features are the columns. Now you can feed this into pretty much any machine learning. There's just libraries and libraries on the internet of machine learning algorithms. You don't really even have to understand how they work necessarily. You do need to understand how do you get your data into a form like this to do this kind of prediction. These are approximations, though, too, right? This is not a fixed number. 
That's right. That's right. Obviously, if you could, if you knew how to mathematically model the function, you would just do it that way. You'd have a perfect answer. But here we're trying to get an approximation of it, right? So in some sense, this is why it's called machine learning. Machine, the machine is learning to approximate the underlying function. Now, I guess one of the important things to understand is, like, in order for this to work, you need to have sort of learning, you have to have example historical data, right, these rows, from representative of the kinds of conditions that you expect to ex experience in the past, right? So if your machine, for example, could enter the state that looks completely different than anything you've ever seen before, then, and you don't have any training data over that state, then you're likely going to not have good predictive performance, right? So it's important that your historical training data be representative of what future states you might come in. This is almost like maintaining a database, though, right? You really need to update your data all the time. That's correct. Well, I, so I think it's, again, you can, uh, in manufacturing, often, you know, you, uh, in a perfect world, a manufacturing line for a particular product doesn't change, right, once you get it deployed. So a lot of the work is up front, and so once you get a model that works for a particular product, for a particular line, there's often not much change that you have to do going forward. But there is a lot of updating on those products because they, the product cycles have accelerated and shortened too, right? That's correct, right? So I think this is actually one of the, you know, so what are some of the challenges with doing this? It's like, okay, it seems pretty simple. I get data range in a matrix and I feed it and I get results. Like what's hard about that, right? I think what you're getting at is Getting the right data is the hard part in some sense, right? Because, you know, maybe you don't have measurements for these every time, or maybe the sensors are noisy, which is, happens at, at certain cases. So I think uh, cleaning, there, there, there's often errors in the data, or data is missing, or, or often just getting the right features. What you need are features here that are actually predictive of this, um, you know. Uh, so you, uh, knowing what are the right features that feed into this is a challenge. So you know, understanding what's possible, understanding that this is how the data helps you understand what's possible, right. and getting data in the right form is actually one of the biggest challenges. So how do you prepare your data? How do you clean it? How do you know it's good? <laughs> how do you know it's good? Well, I think there's some basic rules that you got to follow, right? Like one is, you know, if you have a lot of columns, right, then you need a lot of rows, right? And in some sense, the extreme of this are these large language models where you have, you know, incredibly large space of words. Uh, and so you need billions of records to train it. And so, you know, don't assume you can just have, you know, thousands of features and hundreds of rows, which, and often when you're running semiconductor stuff, you don't have a lot of wafers in your test cases, right? When you're doing NPI. So you have to have a ridiculous, so that's like one. Uh, and then, you know, there's, I think having the right tools, basically, to to sort of accelerate the process. One of the challenges that we have in the semiconductor fab is actually that there's a separation of concerns within, right? There's the person who does the modeling, there's the person who does the data cleaning, there's the person who does the deployment of a model to production, right? That separation creates a lot of handoffs and opportunities for errors. And so I think, you know, one of the recommendations we have is invest in technology where you can provide automation to the process engineers themselves or the equipment engineers themselves so that they can do their own model cleaning and their own uh, model deployment. That helps accelerate a lot of these things because they're the ones who understand like what features are predictive of an outcome and they understand what data is available, they understand what problem they're trying to solve. And so empowering them as much as possible to do the full life cycle is uh, we found to be very beneficial. How about data discovery? That's always been sort of a murky area, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, your data discovery is a problem because, you know, you would think that, you know, every tool on the floor, you, know, you have like, you know, 100 tools on the floor and they're all going to have the same, you know, terminology and the same sensors and the same names. And it just doesn't seem to be the case, right? And so I think that, you know, in order to really accelerate the cycles of learning within the fab, which is really to get lots of these machine learning models deployed to generate a lot of business value, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's helpful to spend some time actually organizing your data ahead of time so that engineers can actually find the data they're looking for without having, again, to sort of call lots of other people to, you know, sort of, just, you know, 
find it, right? You just want to make it discoverable easily within minutes. Another big challenge there is that you've got so much data, you're sort of running under data overload. Yep. You know, I can, we can train people to say, hey, this is machine learning's pretty straightforward, get it scheduled this way. But in the end, you have to, as I said, you can't have too many columns. You can't just throw them all in. You have to pick the ones that matter for the number of rows that you have. And so deciding, like, what are the most predict, you know, what is the most predictive thing of a failure of my vacuum chamber? Like, what are the sensors I should be looking at in the first place? Very challenging. And so, you know, I think there's, that's a place where AI can also, some of this automated AI can really play a role, is that you can actually have, there's some AI systems available in the market today that will automatically search the space of all of your sensor data to try and help identify which sensor feeds or which, you know, material data feeds are actually predictive of the thing that you're trying to predict, whether it's a fault, whether it's a, you know, when you need to replace something, when you need to rebuy something, etc. Does it matter how fast these platforms run, the data platforms? Because there's a wide difference and you've got a lot of them moving in different places, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think this is something that uh, we're starting to see as a real problem because the data platforms today that were, you know, you talked about AI being around since the 50s. You know, some of these data platforms and the fabs are almost as old as that. I exaggerate a little bit, but, you know, they're, they're often decade or two old. They weren't designed with the use cases of AI in mind in terms of the intensity of the amount of data you need to pull from them and the number of times you need to pull from them. And, uh, and likewise, if we move into agentic computing, right, it's not humans accessing it, it's agents, and they're really fast. So I think this is actually a major challenge for, for facilities today is lacking the data platforms that are fast enough uh, to support large amounts of machine learning workloads, AI workloads, without falling over. And machine learning, if you take a look at what's going on in the marketplace these days, it's actually getting productized for the first time. So people are selling models. They're selling different modules of machine learning. How do you deploy those? What sort of problems do you run into? And right. do, they, do they need to be retrained for what you're trying to do here? Yeah, I think that um, most manufacturing facilities that we work with tried AI before. They tried machine learning before. And, you know, maybe five years ago, 10 years ago, with, with no real success, right? And so, you know, as a company, we come in, we experience a lot of, you know, uh, I don't know, cynicism, I guess I would say, like, ah, we tried all this before. But, but the reality is, is that, you know, there's now some sort of, there's now products on the market that are built specifically for the semiconductor market with understanding of their needs, right? And their data shapes, as we like to say. And, you know, sometimes, Actually, what we find increasingly is that a lot of these facilities want to be able, these particularly these IDMs and foundries, they want to be able to build their own models, right, equipment makers. And so it's not, I don't see as many people just buying like pre-built, pre-trained models off the market because they, you know, A, many times the data is very secret and private and, you know, there's no sharing of the data between uh, not a lot of sharing of data in the semiconductor space, and B is because these companies feel that these models are their own IP, so they want to build their own, right? Uh, but the good news is there are now kind of products on the market that are really tuned for enabling AI machine learning in the semiconductor space, and you know I would encourage everyone to go back and look again because I think you know now we're seeing successes where you know ten years ago, not so much. Thanks, John. In the third part of this series, we'll take a closer look at fault detection. Excellent. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I think fault detection is you know, one of the really most prominent ways that machine learning is being deployed within these manufacturing facilities.